Uh, I wanted to go to London, and that didn't work out. You know, I had no desire to live in Italy before I came to Italy. It was really in the last few months when I accepted uh, the offer to come study abroad that I started to go, okay, maybe I should study about, you know, Florence and what life would be like in Italy because everyone who was on the plane with me, I had a year-long program, which is different than most. It wasn't just a semester. Uh, they had, you know, they were obsessed with Italy. This was their biggest dream. I live here forever. I was the only one who was like, I don't know any Italian. I don't even care about being here that much. And um, at the same time, I think that's why I really loved it. I moved here permanently from 2007, so it's actually been 11 years in town this year. Uh, but I lived outside of the center, because at the time I was dating an Italian guy, and his family lived outside of the center, so we lived about in the suburbs, maybe like 15 minutes away. I've always really loved being surrounded by you know, not only history, but the whole artisan crafts. Uh, craftsmanship and the Bottega, so I always knew that that existed here, and it's also less crazy than the other side of the river. So for somebody who has to live here, you know, permanently, it's, it's kind of just a better solution to actually feel like I'm living in the city without being inundated by so many tourists. Now it's so easy. You go on Facebook, Facebook group, hey, what do I do? What is there to look up events? You know, I came back in 2007 where, yes, it existed, and people were using it, but it wasn't as, uh, as useful a tool to meet up with people. It, it was very difficult to transition from going from a student to actually living there uh, full stop and trying to find work, trying to get my visa. So it took me a really long time, and I had those resentful years of, you know, why is it so hard? Questera sucks. Um, everything's against me. People are trying not to pay me. And it and that blocked me from really being able to integrate well, even though I had an Italian boyfriend who, of course, tried to help me through the transition. But he was young, too. He didn't know shit, either. When I got that settled and I got my visa and I was able to start working and do what I really wanted to do, that changed everything. I suddenly was like, okay, I'm no longer treating Italy like an asshole that has something against me. And I'm now starting to actually go, okay, this is actually my life and I enjoy it. It takes a while to get there. It took a couple of years before I felt confident. You know, I, I didn't think too much about what Florence was going to be like, but I imagine it being very small. And I was scared of that fact because I knew I was coming from a city like Los Angeles, so scared that there was going to be nothing to do. Um, I was worried about Italian men because I thought they were going to be all lotharious. Americans have a, a, a sort of anxiety about being abroad sometimes, I feel. And they're always, are we safe, are we safe? So I was in that mindset, of course, too. And I was just scared about, I mean, imagine you never walk anywhere, you're in Los Angeles. I mean, you're suddenly put in a situation where you're walking everywhere, exposed to everyone and everything. I think it's just small compared to the other bigger, more famous cities in Italy. That's the way I look at it. it it's, um, it's a small city with a big city mentality, and since that there's a lot of interesting things going on, it's a very international feel. There's lots of people who have lived here long term but are not from Florence. Before I came to Italy, I did not know how to cook properly. I knew how to make sandwiches and reservations at restaurants. Italy taught me how to cook because I couldn't find anything ready-made. You know, I mean, obviously you have to go to the market, you have to put yourself out there. When I have time, I try to go to the market as much as possible. And there's not just, there's two main ones, with Santa Brogio and San Lorenzo. But I also, they have a square here called Piazza Santo Spirito, and there's a woman that sells uh, veggies every morning too. So, uh, she's great! She's like a personality, she's giving, she's telling me advice. Um, I find that the people who work at the market are, they're like mini encyclopedias. They, they educate you. And they're really happy to hear you, you know, because Italians are brutal. They'll go, if, if, if you sell some shitty vegetables, they'll, they'll go back and slap in your face. Do you have a blog? I do, yes. Yeah, I recognize you. Oh. I think I'm holding some of your papers in my hand. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Ashley. We're Jet. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Well, how fun is that? Oh, thank you. Very much. I'm happy to hear that. I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, it's okay. Good to meet you. It's okay. Hi, Ashley. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet Embrace more slow travel. Stay in Florence, rent an apartment that's you know maybe in the old Tarno or even further, other neighborhoods that people don't even know about, like Lecure or Settignano or Sesto Fiorentino, and kind of try to find a cafe there, go there every day, get to know people, and you'll get a totally different experience even being in a city as touristy as Florence.
Use a local rental agency or go to a hotel that there's often like small bed and breakfasts. For example, there's one in Piazza Beccaria, Villa Landucci. It's called Gourmet Bed and Breakfast Villa Landucci. It's got between five and eight rooms, all named after famous Italian wines. And what's great about them is that it's very affordable. It's between 80 to 100 a night for nice, lots of space, and they're super friendly. So it's find those like tucked away, hidden uh, places in a, in a neighborhood that isn't necessarily in the center. Yeah, my favorite is in San Lorenzo. It's called a Trattoria Sergio Gozzi. It's um, it's a couple of, I think it's a few generations of the Gozzi family that have this Trattoria, but they serve, it's really, you know, marble topped wooden furniture. Tons of locals go there. It's only open for lunch. And they have all of the seasonal favorites, you know. So, like, I was there the other day and I had um, pasta and fagioli with cabalonero. Cabalonero is the Tuscan kale. That was delicious. Burgos and Fernando, you kind of have it all, right? You can get a craft cocktail of Mad Souls and Spirits, which is really, it's on that road too. And then go for the live music either at Knopf or across the street at La Cité, which often hosts live music. And if you want to mingle and meet some Florentines, it's a good middle ground. People like stand outside and, you know, because, well, I mean, it depends on where you live. People kind of stick to their quartiere, of course. And um, in the old Tarno, I would say Santo Spirito and, and Borgo San Fernando are the streets where people go. And then, of course, you have a million other places, depending on where you live. So there's a leather school in Santa Croce, which is cool. I don't personally love the style. I think it's a little bit older. So the great thing is, is you go in there and it's historical because they were helping out the orphans after World War II, uh, which is, they have a cool story, you know, and it's worth going there. It's fun. But um, I love Ben Hart. He's my favorite leather seller. He sells leather jackets. And he's a pair, I mean, everybody who works there is super nice uh, for leather jackets, belts, shoes, that kind of thing. Near San Lorenzo, there's a place called Via de Genori 23R. And that's a really good middle ground because things aren't too pricey, but it's real leather and they have the laboratory in the back. There's a place called Il Torchio, which is a legatorio, so it has a she's like bookbinder, things like that. So she sells a lot of those like leather bound um, notebooks, so that would be fun. I think something like that would be cool. Also, Clet, you know, the street artist that modifies the signs. I don't know if you heard about him. Very cool. Underrated, overrated. I think underrated would be that you can hit it up in a day. I think that, you know, you really do need a full few days to really enjoy the spirit of Florence because you, I will never discourage people from visiting the Uffizi and the Academia and see the game because that's important. You need to see that too. But hire a local guide. Hire a guide for one couple of hours one day so you get the orientation of the city, right? So uh, I always recommend that because that's how I travel now when I go somewhere. I go to Prague, I hire somebody for the first couple of hours, the first day, and then we explore on our own, but we have the knowledge, the history and everything like that. So come, you know, it's not a city, it's not a day trip, it's, it's worth more than that. And I guess overrated, I would say the markets at San Lorenzo. I would say that's overrated. Um, also maybe here in the Porcellino where you were rubbing the pig. I'm going to be cheesy here and I'm going to say spend it in Piazza della Signoria because there's a lot of cool things about Piazza della Signoria in the center. Uh, you know, you have the Palazzo Vecchio, which is the civil seat of power in Florence. It has been and it still is. You have the outdoor art gallery, um, you know, Loggia de Lanzi with all the famous art, works of arts there. And you have Revoir, which is a very famous cafe there in the square. And of course, if you sit down, you're going to pay a ton because it's Florence and it's the squares. But if you go to the bar, they have the best hot chocolate. They also have one of the best Negronis, which is the signature cocktail of Florence. So, what, depending on the hour, or if you're cheeky like me and you don't care if you're drinking a Negroni at noon, I, I just think that if you have an hour, just work your way through that. People watch in Longe de Lancy, visit Plaza Vecchio, get a coffee, and then go on your merry little way.